Hi everyone, this is Jewish Talk, coming to you from NASA Community College on 90.3 WHBC, also streaming on the iHeart and the iTunes app. This program is later archived on Spreaker.com. So you know the routine. This is Rabbi Pearl. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It all depends on when you are listening. Well, let's look at this. There are some arguments that are basically petty affairs between small people who feel a little bit bigger, they need to stand up for their perceived honor and status. There are other kind of arguments that are really honest differences of opinion between people of stature. And each person has their worthy consideration, their opinion. So we need to be able to discern, to decipher the subtleness between the surface, you know, what's going on, what's on, what lies below the surface of any debate before we know what kind of argument it is whether it belongs to the petty affairs of small people, or is it really big people having a difference of opinion? Well, let's turn to the 16th chapter of the book of Numbers that we read just yesterday. It tells a story of a mutiny led by Korach. This individual was a cousin of Moses who challenged Moses' authority. In the end, Korach and his henchmen are swallowed up by the earth in a very dis divine display of justice. And the Medish reveals some of the behind the scenes dialogue between the men. What was the argument between Moses and Korach? Korach and Moses. Remember, Korach was no pushover. Besides being of a noble lineage, he was clever, wealthy, and quite charismatic. One of the questions Korach put to Moses was this. Does a house full of holy books still require a mezuzah. You got a room, you got a whole library of Jewish books. Do you still need to have the mezuzah on the doorway? Moses says, if sure. Korah scoffed at this idea. Yes, yeah, ridiculous, Moses. Come on. A little mezuzah contains the Shema. Okay, it has two chapters of the Torah. But you have a, a library full, a house full of books with the entire Torah. Won't that do the trick? And a little mezuzah will. Doesn't make any sense, argued Moses, argued Korach. So why was Moses' answer correct? Why was he correct in saying, even if you have a full, full, wall-to-wall holy Torah books in your library, you still need that little mezuzah on the doorway. So the Lubavitch Rebbe explains, you know, it's all about location. The books are on the inside. And the mezuzah is on the outside. What are we talking about? When there are Jewish texts inside our study and living room, okay, so this indicates that the house is, of course, a Jewish home. Right? Fair enough. Fair enough. That is good. That's the way it should be. But what happens when we leave the comfortable confines of our home? Do we see? The mezuzah is at the threshold of our home. At the juncture, what is it? It's on the doorway. That's a juncture. It represents a crossover between our inner lives and our outer lives. As we make the transition from the private person to the public citizen when we're leaving, we need to be reminded of whom we are and that we take our identity with us wherever we go. There's only one God, says the little scroll, whether in our private domain or in the big, wide world. Let me share with you one of the may, many works by the well-known author, Herman Wouk, who, by the way, is buried in the Beth David Cemetery in Elmont. I happened to have been there and chanced upon his, his uh, burial place. He wrote a, an audiographical uh, novel called Inside Outside, in which he portrays his own inner struggles straddling these two worlds. He had a pious Talmudist grandfather who had a tremendous profound influence on him. At the same time, this Herman Wouk, who was influenced by Hollywood and Broadway. And it took him a long time to find his way to settle into an observant Jewish lifestyle while still writing bestsellers. 
So being Jewish on the inside is relatively easy. You got a house full of books, it's all fantastic. It's when we hit the outside, when we encounter the temptation, the turmoil of outside, that's where the challenge comes to us. How we, we must face it and remain proudly who we are, even in the face of conflicting cultures that we see on the outside, curious looks and often hostile attitudes. You know, in the old days, there used to be a saying back in the German Jewish communities, there was a slogan that has long been discredited. In Hebrew, it says like this, Yehudi beveitecha v'adam beteitecha. Be proud of who you are as a Jew in your home and be a human being on the outside. You see, the Nazis did not distinguish between those who looked Jewish or those who had removed any visible identifying marks. So today, traditional dress reflecting a national character is common. It's accepted and respected from the Scottish kilts to the Arab kafirs. The outlandish hairstyles, think of all the house, outlandish hairstyles of sportsmen and celebrities, are not only accepted, gewalt geschrigen, they are mimicked mindlessly by millions of wannabes. Is it too much to expect of ourselves to assert our Jewishness in an unfilial corporate territory? To keep our keeper on our heads even when we are walking outside of the synagogue? So Moses rejected Korach's argument with good reason. The mezuzah did not replace the need for Jewish libraries because it serves as a perennial reminder on our doorways. As we step out of our home to the enter the outside world, the mezuzah kind of beckons us to take our God, our Torah, and our values, and our traditions along with us. Let me continue on the same vein. Despite all the dramas of the world in turmoil, I sometimes get the feeling that we live in a very boring world. Everything is so politically correct. God forbid we should say what we really, what we really think. Now recently, just recently, I attended a dinner for a local organization. This was of course before uh, COVID-19. I attended a uh, dinner and an entertainer, the entertainer was a comedian. He got up and he told the audience that the rabbi had called him and made him promise that he, would, he wouldn't use any risque material. Then another committee member reminded him not to be a racist or an anti-religious or a gender discriminatory in his jokes. Then he says a third made him promise not to offend any minority groups. Having been duly stripped of every opportunity for satire, right, he was an entertainer, the comedian just said, ladies and gentlemen, good night, and he walked off the stage. The argument of Korach, the mutineer, in this week's Torah portion, smacks of such inane political correctness. Let me explain. Korach accuses Moses and Aaron of nepotism, of grabbing positions of power for themselves. And in doing so, he insists that the entire community is holy. Why do you exalt yourselves over the congregation of God, is what Korach said. In fact, the same argument could be used against Jewish people in general. Why do you th- who do you think you are? Chosen people. Why aren't all men created equal? The fact is, we are different. Everyone is different. <laughs> Ask any anti-Semite, he'll confirm it. The blatant hypocrisy of nations of the world and the international media in constantly holding Israel to a higher standard of morality than it does of its neighbors only reaffirms that we actually adhere to a value system that is distinctive and unique. And in general, I think the arguments today about of uh, differences and everything matters, every, we, the strengths that we have come from our differences. You know, if we're all living a life of copy and paste, there's nothing going on over here. We actually dilute ourselves when we try to be something other than ourselves. So there is something important about being different. Of course, when we use the differences, 
to complement each other, to share with each other, and to share that which is others are giving to us. So indeed we do. So what does this mean? It doesn't mean when we talk about the chosen people, it means some, uh, some, it's not about privilege, it means a greater responsibility. Rather than making a person pompous and condescending, it's really part and parcel of how we must be more sensitive and a more humane nation on this world. And that is a, precisely why, if we do occasionally veer from those principles, it's such an aberration that it becomes like, you know, front page news. Our belief in and in respect of the inherent worth of every human being does not contradict our conviction that Judaism is unique. Does not every single religion maintain that its path is the correct one? Almost all, besides Judaism, actively, you know, kind of reaches out to, to, uh, to, to present itself. That, that's, that's it. Now, we don't go out of our way to seek converts because we recognize, we believe, that the righteousness, there's righteousness in all of the nations and a righteous person has a share in the world to come. And a person does not need to become Jewish in order to get a slice of paradise. Now, some years ago, um, there was this discussion going on in, uh, I think it was in South Africa, about this whole conversation. Now, um, there was a local newspaper there who was discussing discussing this. This was, this was the... They actually, actually, yes, I'm reminding myself, it happened at the University of Cape Town. And they were considering building a student religious facility which would unite all three major faiths in one house of worship. It was to service the Muslims, the Christians, and the Jewish people there in a combined mosque, church, synagogue, and it was to be known as the Mos Churagog. Okay. So the local rabbi was asked by a local newspaper what he thought of the idea. And the answer was that the, that the, the, the mistaken presumption in the founders' thinking was that three separate faiths could not possibly get along. There was therefore a need to combine them into one composite. The fact that, that we each have our own distinct set of beliefs and, par- and practices is that's, that's our strength. And we shouldn't suppress individuality to achieve harmony. And this is an ongoing argument about d- does everybody have to be doing the same thing to be equal? The answer is no. No. Equal means that equal, each one equally from their perspective, from their differences, is adding to the beauty of this world. So the, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, whose 26th yard site was observed this past week, explained at the, the, the Midrashic account of Korach's rebellion. Korach gathered his men and they donned garments made of tcheles, of blue wool, used for the tzitzes. Right? We, we have a mitzvah of of, uh, to tie on the, uh, on our corners, on our four corners, it's called tzitzis. And his argument went like this. There's a garment made holy, made, uh, like, made full of this blue wool. Does it still need the individual tzitzis hanging up, the individual strands of blue wool on the sides, on the corner? That's how they challenged Moses. Moses answered and said, yes. And they laughed at him. If one strand of treles, of this blue wool, exempts the entire garment, does not the whole garment of treles exempt it? It's all, it's all full of the blue wool. So the Rebbe said, this was precisely the argument of Korach. The entire garment, that means the entire congregation is holy. We're all treles, we're all holy wool. There's no need for distinction between us. Why do you, Moses and Aaron, appoint yourself leaders and exalt yourself over us? fact is, however, that distinctions are a necessary reality of life. While we don't look to create divisions between people, not everybody is a doctor. 
Imagine if every fellow who felt like playing physician would hang up a sign outside his house and start dispensing medicine. Boy, oh boy, we would have a real very sick society. So the Rebbe was a great humanitarian. He was concerned about every nation and every single individual, Jew and Gentile alike, and tried to make it make a difference to the broader society. As evidenced by the Rebbe's efforts for a sacred moment of silence in American uh, public schools and the Rebbe's emphasis on education for all. But simultaneously, he was adamant that Israel needs to be uncompromising in its territorial strategy to safeguard the security of its citizens. Humanitarianism need not mean blurring all the lines. Imagine John Lennon's peace song, Where There Are No More Religions, is not only impractical and, uh, you know, it's, de- it's denial of the truth. We don't all have to be the same to get along. Within our people, right? Uh, am I not correct? In our, in, within our own communities, we have a Kohenim, some are Kohenim, some are uh, Levites, well, the rest of us, like myself, eh, just from the rest of the tribes, I'm an Israelite. So, so, so too, there are doctors, there's lawyers, there's priests, there's prophets. The challenge of those who hold legitimate, genuine high office is to keep the distinctions from disintegrating into divisiveness. A colleague, a, 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 a I would say, a, a rabbinical colleague of mine tells me that he had an extensive contact with one of the most popular and renowned entertainment celebrities of our time, Amachaya. This star is not only hugely famous, wealthy and successful, but has been acclaimed around the globe for his rare talent and genius. No, showing. Hundreds of thousands of fans wish they could have his life and that they, they could be with him. In the course of the conversations, the rabbi asked this man, what is it that he constantly wishes for in his life? And you know what he answered? Obscurity. His dream is to fade from the limelight, lead a simple, anonymous man on the street, white picket fest, fence, so to speak, existence. So again, as we read the Torah portion, Korach, we meet a man who by all accounts was a very intelligent, affluent, and gifted individual, Korach. He was a Levite by birth. He already occupied a position of prominence and prestige within the Jewish community of the time. Yet he rallied together a band of fellow Levites to challenge the leadership of Moses and the priesthood of Aaron. And he argued, as we've been discussing, come on, the entire community, all we're all holy, and God is amongst us all. Korach protests, so why do you, Moses and Aaron, exalt yourself over everybody else? How virtuous, how egalitarian. After all, every soul, bar none, is, is, has a spark of God. How then can these distinctions that we draw between ourselves, whereby this one is a tribal prince, this one is a Levite, this one's a priest, another one is a high priest, let's all stand as one without separations or distinctions. Isn't that interesting in how it relates to the world that we live in today, the constant arguments? Righteous indignation is often nothing more than an envy with a halo. Indeed, for all of his man of the people posturing, Korach was not nearly as unselfish and altruistic as his words really might suggest. The man felt rebuffed in that Aaron, and not he, was granted the high, high priesthood and could not abide this uh, perceived snub of his own standing and his own stature. In responding to Korach, Moses said, Is it too much of you, uh, for you, um, offspring of Levi, that you are? In other words, can't you not recognize the beauty and uniqueness of the gifts that you have? Isn't this what we're hearing today? You remember, you remember, you, 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 have, you have everything going for yourself. As a Levite, you're a keeper of the sanctuary, you're a respected dignitary, you have so much going for yourself. How could you possibly be discon- discontent? Why must you seek the priesthood as well, when God clearly gave it to somebody else? Right? Isn't, that, isn't that what we're constantly seeking throughout life? Constantly, Korah's begrudging spirit gave him no peace, and he ultimately led to a, a disastrous end for him and his group. And the sages teach us 
So there is no man who does not have his place. That's the case, the commentators ask. Why is it that there are so many people who are so unhappy with their lot? The answer is that instead of savoring their own special place and flourishing with it, they crave the place that belongs to somebody else. Isn't that interesting? The reason God created man as a single unit rather than an entire species, as he did with the animal kingdom, is to show that one man equals the world, says the Mishnah. Every individual is unique. We were handpicked to fulfill a specific mission, a mission that only you can perform. That mission is to enhance and to perfect, perfect the world. And what is your world? It's whatever you wake up to in the morning. Your life, your family, your community, your personality, your problems, your circumstances, that's your world. That's the life that you were put into. And that's where your purpose can be found. We don't sit around uh, saying, if only. We don't do that. If only I had kids like those. If only my mother wouldn't have married my father. If only I were better looking, more intelligent, more talented. If only I were, you know, a president of the country, uh, you know, whatever it may be. It makes for nice fantasy, perhaps, but a, a total waste of time and energy when, of course, when it invades reality of, of what we're all about. <laughs> that's, that's, that's my point, my friends. Let us be happy with who we are and stop trying to be like somebody else. When we live with a sense of divine purpose, then we recognize who we are. Our life is what it is because that's what it's meant to be. And it's within our own life that, we can, that we've been called upon to serve the Creator and to fulfill our very distinctive mission and purpose. Korach would have done well, and would we all, to heed the profound words of the serenity prayer, right? We all know the serenity prayer. The key to living a good and happy life is to have the courage to change those things which can be changed. The serenity to accept those things which cannot be changed, and the wisdom to know the difference. I didn't know that, I, and I knew that prayer. But that's the point, my friends. When Tavia the milkman demands of God, would it spoil some vast eternal plan if I were wealthy, if I were a wealthy man? The answer is, of course not. In fact, your being a wealthy man is very much part of the vast eternal plan. Now, as to the definition of wealth, who is rich, say the sages? He who is happy with his lot. The Hasidic master, Rabbi Zusha of Anipali, once said, that if I were offered a deal wherein I could trade places with the patriarch Abraham so that he could be Zusha and I would be Abraham, I would not take it. For although I would benefit by being Abraham, what gain would there be for God? He still would still have one Abraham and one Zusha. A person who sees the essence of life as serving the will of the Creator doesn't need to spend useless energies craving places which are greener, or as we would say, grass being greener, we think on the other side. Because that person finds meaning, purpose, joy, and fulfillment in the place where the grass is greener. And you know where the grass is greener? Right in our own backyard. And that is what is going through my mind on this special weekend as we come from this past Thursday marking the 26th yard site, the passing of the Rebbe, 26 years ago. And throughout the day, all over the internet, there was a, a Zoom meeting. As you know, the Zoom has become very popular today with people gathering that way. I must tell you that around the Jewish community on Thursday, Throughout the United States, throughout the world, there were more than several hundred thousand people participating on Zoom platforms, discussing, learning, being inspired, reflecting on the Rebbe's life and what it meant to each and every one of us. And I want to tell you a, 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 a couple of stories that, that would reflect this. The idea of, of all of us being leaders at this time and being, exact, being exactly happy and appreciative of where we are at any given moment. Because where we are at any given moment is where we're supposed to be. And from that vantage point, we can make a difference from the world 
from what, you know, from where we are at that particular time. Not trying to pretend and act like anybody else or to take what belongs to someone else. Many years ago, there were two yeshivas, two day schools in uh, Brazil. And the financial situation was so difficult, so the two board of directors thought it would be a good idea to bring them both together, to, to unite one school. One of the principals was a Chabadnik, and he was well-liked, and he was offered the job of being the principal of this new school. He said, I, I can't agree to this before I speak to my Rebbe, Rabbi Schneerson. He told the Rebbe about the idea of the schools coming together and that he would be the principal. The Rebbe says, no, I disagree. They should remain two separate schools. So he goes back and he tells him, listen, if you want to fire me, you can fire me. But I'm not going to take this position. And in fact, the Rebbe himself is not, is not even for this whole uniting of the two schools. They must remain two schools. Well, they listened. A few months later, the rabbi himself came to Crown Heights and he had the opportunity to meet with the Rebbe and he said, you know, they listened to you back in Brazil, they kept the two schools, but they're really upset about it because financially doesn't, doesn't make sense and many, many issues there. And what, what was the reason that you, you insisted that they should remain two schools? So the Rebbe says, you know, if you told me, if you'd asked me right away, I would have told you. He said, listen, invariably people don't like a school. One parent doesn't like the food, this one doesn't like the teacher, this one doesn't like the sports, this one doesn't like the tea. Everybody doesn't like something. So what happens if a parent says, I don't like your school, she's going to take the kid out of this yeshiva and put them into the second one. Can you imagine if there's only one school and a particular parent doesn't like that school, what's going to do? They're going to take the kid out of the yeshiva and put them into a, into a regular secular school and the child will be deprived of a Jewish education. That's, my friend, is the difference between a leader and, you know, a financial person. Financially, it didn't make sense, right? It didn't make sense. The two schools, all the, all the, you know, drain of finances and pressure on the community. But the Rebbe saw long term. Long term, if you have two schools, has choices for people. It also explains why communities have several synagogues. So even if you don't like one place, you can go to another place. But the idea of a leader, we all must think like a leader and have that kind of perspective in life as we go forward. This is your host, Rabbi Pearl, wishing you a wonderful day, a wonderful week. Stay safe and looking forward. All the best.